welcome everyone. Uh, we are going to um, give a, it's a short talk. Uh, we don't have enough time to explore the extent of the topic, but uh, we will cover main elements and uh, um, because it's a very vast, uh, autism in itself is very, very vast to be studied and uh, not to say the topic of obsession, self-obsession. For the ones who are here for the first time and are not familiar with um, the Spiritist Society of Baltimore, here our mission is to study the Spiritist teachings. Okay. They were uh, brought by the French man educator, uh, Alan Kardec, 150 some years ago. 52 this year and um, with the teachings we of course finally make peace uh, in regard to what science says we accommodate the teachings of science with the teachings of religion and philosophy all together so here we find common grounds for this type of discussion all together but the main tenet is really to boost our faith through our reasoning. So here we put an end to blind faith and we welcome rational faith. I think this is very controversial in many ways for many people say you don't have to think about God and life. We think otherwise. If God gave us intelligence we shall use it for the best and this is one of the purposes we are here. And this is why we think this topic is very important. Because of all things, in regard of mental health, as a psychologist and a neuroscientist, besides being a spiritist, I understand as much as the board of directors of the Spiritist Society of Baltimore that we should kickstart the series of talks and workshops this month on mental health by addressing one of the ones that is in escalating. And for some of you who either have experiences at personal level or professional level, you probably know much more than we are going to explore here. But the goal is just to recap some of the elements that science tells us, and then from there, we're going to expose what the Spiritist teachings and the revelations bring to us. And at the end, we're going to wrap up with the Spiritist therapy, because that's what we can offer here or can be offered anywhere where Spiritism is being uh, uh, presented. So, the puzzle. It's very puzzling. It is a puzzling uh, mental disorder. It is considered a mental disorder. And this is actually how beautiful they created the symbol of autism, of this puzzles all together and we should raise awareness but before we do that to get to know more we need to define what we're talking about autism is so vast but the main definition is it's a very complex and it's a developmental disability that typically appears in the first three years of life and affects a person's ability not only to communicate but to interact with others so we're talking about emotional slash social impairments, if we could say this way. This is the least we can translate into the understanding of autism. And uh, the main thing is to understand that the reason why we should pay closer attention uh, to this disorder is because in 2007, a year ago, uh, a year and a half ago almost, we got to know that it's escalating to this level. One in 150 American children. Ten years, 20 years ago, it was one in 10,000. Of course, many people say, oh, that's because we are better at diagnosing it. That's what many people are telling us nowadays. We know that more children are autistic nowadays because now we understand more the spectrum of the disease, 
but not necessarily. Uh, and Spiritism would actually say that not necessarily that's the reason why. It's actually escalating. There are underlying reasons that probably psychology, medicine, sciences overall cannot respond, but Spiritism can. And mostly it happens in boys. So the rate in boys is even more dramatic. One in less than a hundred boys will be diagnosed with autism. But the sad part of it is that most of them will be diagnosed at an age where it be when it becomes more difficult because parents have a hard time. They are not aware of this. And that's the reason why each one of us should be more fully aware, not only for our family, but to help one another and to help the ones in our lives. So autism, as we said, happens more in boys than girls, and we have spiritual answers for that as well. This is the, uh, the uh, we have here in Maryland, you see in Bethesda, the Autism Society of America. There are several organizations, from the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, D.C., to several national and local organizations that are raising awareness. And here's some information. Actually, January was the, the month of autism awareness. And here is, are some of the uh, characteristics. They may come together or separated. But for example, autistic children usually avoid eye contact. So then we say, maybe we're all autistic. <laughs> Maybe we are at different levels and we don't know because socially we shouldn't avoid, we should always skip contact with the people who are engaging. Uh, the echoes, words or phrases and someone says, uh, how are you doing? They repeat, how are you doing? That may happen as well. They uh, maybe have difficulties in interacting with others as you can see in the picture. Others, they they have this some type of obsessive behavior and you see like some boys they like to align the toys in some way okay and in an obsessive compulsive way uh, others uh, they have inappropriate attachments to objects for example or difficulty in expressing needs and gestures they need something and it's right there, like uh, they have a glass of water in front of them, they are thirsty, they don't pick it up and drink. And sometimes parents need to pay attention, say, what is the matter? And they, they have somewhat the, a difficulty in addressing their own needs. May not want, you know, to be caressed or cuddled. It's the emotional disability expressed there. Sometimes they express insensitivity to pain. Sometimes they prefer to be alone at times that they shouldn't be alone. Like here, let's say right here and now, we're all together and then suddenly they outcast themselves. You know, they prefer to be alone, isolated. You see, we're talking about symptoms that should be never diagnosed by our own selves. It's a combination of all of them, okay? But as we often hear the psychologist saying, we may have some of these autistic traits inside of all of us. Uh, and I always wonder if in more evolved planets, that's going to disappear very likely. Okay, so we're not saying that there are some people like trying to label anybody, but just identifying elements and many other behaviors, characteristics that would uh, help us understand that this child is suffering from these developmental uh, impairments. Many people ask, what are the physical causes? We could stand here for the rest of many hours taking many scientific studies that reported possibilities, but the reason why this happens till now is unknown. There are many things that are pointed out, but still there is no like something set in stone saying this is the reason why, physically speaking. So that's why 
I decided we are not going to talk about them because this is for the physicians to take care of. We know, at least at the brain level, besides genes and everything else that people can report, in the brain of the many structures that may be involved in autistic uh, disorders, for the emotional component is this very structure that we call the amygdala. The amygdala, it's like an olive-shaped structure, mostly related with our emotional uh, modulation, and uh, there are reports pointing to the direction that this is one of the structures in the brain that is not um, um, healthily activated, let's say this way. But still, uh, it's unknown. There's a big question mark in regard to that. And because it's escalating, people are feeling like we have something to do. Okay? There are parents nowadays, they already know if they give proper nutrition to these children, they may, you know, um, bend some of the impairments that happen with the disorder. Actually, uh, some many types of therapy. So we would certainly recommend that to have the therapists, the doctors involved <laughs> in addressing it. But we are here now going to devote the rest of our conversation to the spiritual part of it. Because we know, for we are here, we already know, that when the first, the first cell before we reincarnate is conceived, there is life connected to that cell. And that's where our journey begins. Because many parents, many parents who have autistic children, they feel guilty. They think, I gave them my gene. And that's when the worst thing happens. I've seen marriages that are destroyed because they can't live with that. And usually, fathers are the ones that run away first because they can't take it. They can't face uh, nothing. It's not a, a feminist talk, but it's a fact that usually the, the, the fathers are the ones who can't stand facing a scenario that somewhat they feel guilty for. But here you're going to see parents shouldn't blame themselves because there is a bigger plan. And actually, the soul that is there, reincarnated, has somewhat chosen that, that story. How? How we're going to address this? The other day, we were talking in a study session about the possibility, as many physicists that are already say, that there are many universes parallel universes in this <coughs> creation, okay? And uh, for the ones who only see three dimensions, to understand things at fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth dimension is really overwhelming. But we are now going to exercise trying to see the story of our lives from the perspective of immortality. So we're going to raise ourselves above this life because it's going to be quite impossible to understand this journey if we stick our vision with one life alone. People will ask, how can somebody choose to be autistic? In one single life perspective, I agree. It is impossible. But if we raise ourselves above the one life view, if we raise ourselves to understand that we are immortal beings who have lived before and will live to endless time, then we'll begin to grasp God's view about ourselves. We're not going to try to be God, but we'll exercise the intelligence that God gave us to understand what is this one life experience in so many. It's a preparation for things in the future and at the same time rebalancing things from the past. So how does that happen? 
In the Gospel According to Spiritism, on chapter 14, item 9, one of our preferred passages, there we have Allan Kardec bringing the teachings that we found in the New Testament. When Jesus brought to us the saying, Honor your father and your mother. Well, from there, we got many messages from good spirits trying to unfold the mysteries of trying to honor parents who sometimes we don't feel we should do. So then, St. Augustine, in the spare realm, through a medium, in item 9, he starts telling us, it's like a story, but it's a very true story. He says, what about those people who in their lives, they decided to take shortcuts. Shortcuts sometimes that were labeled as crimes. Crimes that when they crossed over to the spirit realm, either they were victims or they were the very villains of the story. They were the very people who, if they were villains, they repented. And if they were the victims, some, not many, still in our planet, they feel enraged with the people that made them suffer on earth. And they, he says, what happens to them? They stay in the spirit realm for some time, and then, before they reincarnate again, if they open the opportunity, if they get tired of that, either the anger or the repentance, they will open a door for the spirit, the more elevated spirits, to come and rescue them, prepare them for a new opportunity. Often, an opportunity among the very people that they either made them suffer or they were hurt by those very people. And that's when the plenty of our reincarnation happens. Like we're going to see this story in this book by Divaldo Franco. So, how does the union of the spirit and the body happen? So here we have in a book that was mediumistically written by the medium Divaldo Franco, whom many of you know, and uh, the spirit who reported it through Divaldo Franco is the former spirit doctor, Manuel Flamengo de Miranda. And he comes to us and says that this spirit, Orino, this is the name of the spirit. I, I love when they put these very exotic names because it feels like it's not us, but it could be us. <laughs> but it's not anybody else that we know because if he says Joseph, oh, I know Joseph, maybe that's him. Luckily, the spirits know, so they create these other names that are quite unknown to us. And Orino, he went through that process we talked about. And the spirit architects, they were planning his reincarnation. And these are the very words that Miranda brings to us. Orino knew his future parents, like many of us knew before we came here, to whom he was connected since past lives. He makes so much sense. And his parents carried healthy biological elements which he needed to carry through his tasks in the new reincarnation. Now, his parents carried healthy biological elements that Orino would benefit from to form his body. But now, see this. He got to know at the same time that he would have a brother with mental illness, whom would be instrument of inner transformation, patience, and other virtues to be exercised by both parents and Orino. So we're talking about the same parents. The genetic code of them offering possibilities for two different spirits, having physical bodies, that would be helpful to what they needed. One needed to be healthy, and the other one needed to experience mental illness. It's very same parents. So parents shouldn't feel guilty, for they gave the genes to that spirit who was reincarnated with a disability. 
for first and foremost, we're going to learn that there is a reason behind it. And then we get to know that Orino, before he reincarnated, just so we see, feel the care when before we came here, how we were cared for, we received special treatments. The passes therapy, as you know, the healing, the perispiritual redu reduction, which is a normal process so it can fit in into a new body and grow, expand as it grows the new body in his spiritual body or perispirit to be ready for reincarnation. They use these techniques there, hypnotherapy. That's where they come from. Here is just a mirror image, a very rough image of the many possibilities that can come from the real plane. As Plato said, the world of ideas is the real one and truly is the world of spirit. He was prepared for the deep awareness on the work to be performed in that new reincarnation and he visited his future parents several times in order to get the proper attunement for the accomplishment of the plans for that new life. So each one of us, very likely, before we reincarnate, we visit parents. If we're not obsessing them already, because those cases exist, then we may visit them with mercy, the mercy of God, accompanied by our guardian angels, the parents' guardian angels, so we can acclimate ourselves into each other's energy field, let's say this way. Now, see the pictures. Before Arena was conceived and he was in the spirit realm already smiling about it, there was a spirit doctor named Germano who was assigned to apply special energy therapy onto Arena. His spiritual body would be reduced to a newborn size. It's our spiritual body. There, when our spiritual body shrinked in ways that now we can't accommodate in our minds, how does that happen? But in the future, the spiritist science will probably unfold it for us. It's when all the memories, all the files of previous lives are compressed, like we say nowadays, zipped. <laughs> Zip file. It's in the zip file. So it takes a while to really access it. And they are there, compressed. That's why when we reincarnate, we don't recall things that easily from previous lives. Because the files are compressed. Thank God they are. For we hopefully don't need to know all that much. Then, these are actually a scientific studies. The sperms that were um, stained with uh, fluorescence, so scientists could study special composition of them. But here we use the image so we can picture the journey. Okay? Who chose the genetic code for that new body? The parents? No. The very spirit. So the very words of Miranda, and touching Germano the doctor. Orino's crown chakra, the mentor induced the dislocation of a powerful mental wave from Orino himself, which entered the uterus of his future mother and reached a specific sperm cell. The impulse of that energy gave new speed to that sperm cell which won the race into conception. So it's not about the fittest, no. It's about the sperm that has the cold that is needed to form that new body. Plus the ovum of the mom that is going to be receiving that extra uh, genetic load. Then they continue. That specific sperm contained the paternal DNA that contained the needed elements for Arena's physical constitution in conjunction with the material ovule. So then we learn that the genetic imprinting, when people say, I think this is genetic, they are right. But what they don't know is that there is a cause to the genetic imprinting. What for material science 
it finishes there. That's the cause of all things. The genes, for us, it has a cause in itself. Okay? So the genetic imprint in another book by the medium, um, Livaldo Franco, another spirit doctor named Dr. Ferreira, he brings to us that the genetic imprinting comes from the mind of the soul that is about to reincarnate. That mind, our mind, in our deep conscience, is going to send that message into our spiritual body. From there, it's going to imprint itself in the genes. And if vibratory disturbances were present in the mind of all of us, they were imprinted in the perispirit through the gene and then in the genes and going to produce altered neurochemistry, altered biological events. So we are the soul responsible for our a physical outcome. Okay? But the other day someone was asking me about autism and then she said, but Vanessa, what about environmental conditions? They are triggering what we call the genotype. If uh, I have in my genotype the possibility, the potential to develop schizophrenia, it may or may not be developed into what I call my phenotype, which is what's going to come out as my appearance. Appearance in traits, biological appearance, so on and so forth. So we're talking about environmental cues actually triggering something that genetically is already in predisposition. Still, that person is not a victim. No one is. No one is a victim of anything in life. Because if it happens for responsibility of someone else, still we needed that experience. We didn't deserve it. So we may phrase it again and again. We don't deserve to suffer. But sometimes we attract that suffering for reasons that now one life cannot explain. In this sense, what are the spiritual causes? And now we need to hold on to our astonishment. Because some we think that just to diagnose spiritually speaking this may be too cruel. But the fact is that the doctor, the spirit doctor Bezerra de Menezes, who is actually one of the spirit doctors who takes care of many people in the planet, and uh, sent already spirit doctors to take care of some of the works we do at the SSB. Leonardo is going to, in two weeks, talk more about this spirit doctor, whom we shall know better. He came once through the hands of uh, Chico, uh, uh, Chico Xavier and then Divaldo Franco in this book, uh, Madness and Obsession, to tell us about cases. And he says, in regard to autism, It's kind of a temporary protection from the autistic person's enraged victims and the memories of unhealthy choices in the past. Hmm, what does that mean? Okay, I'll put a pause here. Ask a question. Question for all of us. We may not answer it out loud, but inside of our minds. What is the likelihood because we know evil doesn't exist. It's simply the absence of goodness. That's what it is. It's like darkness doesn't exist. <coughs> Physics tells us that darkness is simply the absence of light. So light exists. Darkness is simply the absence. So knowing that we are in this progress, this infinite progress, what is the likelihood that in previous lives, we did uh, only good things, knowing that we're still ignorant of so many things. So likely, don't you think, that in previous lives we made unhealthy choices as well? Healthy and unhealthy choices. 
then. Then, the unhealthy ones likely hurt others. It's just the way it happens. And then, where those who we, whom we've hurt have been? Still connected with us. But the worst part of it, we forget, is when we don't realize that everything we do, others may not know, but it stays here. The inner Las Vegas, I call. You know, what happens here stays here and really stays here in our conscience. We may lie to everybody, but to ourselves. The inner God is fully aware of every thought, every feeling, every action. And the problem is that when here we are not distracted anymore with the things of matter, when we are in the spirit realm, we face it with full force, the actions, the feelings, everything that we are. And then we develop what we call in spiritism, self-obsession. Self-obsession is when we have this negative, persistent negative thought about ourselves. And then you may say, oh my gosh, I already have it. Because sometimes we don't think we are capable of certain things. That's self-obsession. If we have that in a persistent manner, I'm not able, I'm not capable, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve to have a good company in my life, I don't deserve this. That I, well, that's named self-obsession in spiritism. Spiritism as a science has these technical terms, and this is one of them. So then, these spirits who committed outrageous actions that hurt many, they will have developed the self-obsession and will, in a way, develop what we call autism. See, we're not labeling here. We're just trying to understand. And it's inevitable that we discuss here this possibility. And for those who are still skeptical, we ask, where are those people who come, for example, and make huge crimes? They create wars, and, and this is not in a political way. We're just saying any type of war, maybe a small war, maybe a big war. Wars in families, creating discord. People who commit suicide, usually the people who commit suicide is because someone pushed them as well to that edge. They are called responsible. Where are those people? They vanish from the universe or the universes? No. They will come back. And they better. Because we need each other to balance ourselves. They will come back. How are they going to come back if they are now fully aware of everything that they have done? So the journey of finding new balance has three steps, Spiritism says. One step is repentance. Not this repentance that we learned with the church like years ago that we're going to punish ourselves. No, it's the awareness. It was wrong. I missed the mark. There are no sins nor sinners. There's just uh, an unhealthy choice. And there it was. Missed the mark. So I am aware. Say, you know, wrong. But from there on, the journey is a little tough. Because from there, there is another step, which we call in spiritism, we use this word that is very unknown to the common English speaker, expiation. I will translate in, a, in some other words that are more common. Atonement. So we atone in itself. When we realize that something was off, we suffer automatically. We feel like, ah, oh, it hurts inside of us. We feel ashamed. It hurts our pride. 
from that step onwards, experiencing that consequent suffering that comes with the awareness that we missed the mark, we reach a third step, which is reparation. We need to repair. How? For example, if we are one day at the forefront of a movement like this one of autism awareness, there we go. We are repairing already. If we are a scientist that is helping trying to find a cure, we are repairing already. Probably those were already at the third step of a journey that began lives ago. Their lives, their soul is of atonement. But there will be a next one when it's going to happen, the reparation. There are, there are lives that are already repairing by helping the very child that has autism. It's a way to repair already, to help someone else. Thanks, God, thanks to God, there are many ways of repairing. But the fact is that in autism, the spirits revealed that usually that soul, aware of how many times they missed the mark, they get into a new reincarnation and develop this developmental mental disorder that is a way for them. It's a temporary protection because they are trying to run away from their own sad memories. That's why they're far away. And they are also disguised in a new body. Mercy of God. So the ones whom they hurt cannot find them temporarily. That happens as well. A case for us, Anderson's case. In this book by Dr. Bezerra, he tells us about Anderson as a spirit who was the typical case of autism. And uh, as Dr. Bezerra says, we're technically before they are big, it was a vigorous case of self-obsession. Someone who was deeply guilt, feeling guilty about things he did in the past. The parents, through the eyes of the parents, they couldn't tell because he didn't express that guilt. But to the eyes of the spirit, guardian angels, the spirit mentors, it was clear. They could see the mental patterns, the thoughts, and everything. And they recognized, they diagnosed self-obsession. So now you have the cues already of how we can boost the treatment where it is. Then inner guilt in Anderson's case was due to the criminal actions he made in previous lives. And I'll, I'll summarize to you the, the, what Dr. Bezer says. Anderson was a man that in the eyes of everybody he was very neat a gentleman, but he had a life that was a surprise for everybody because he liked to write letters to people when he didn't like those people, anonymous letters. He would write, and people nowadays, they do that in emails. <laughs> Worse, because letters could be lost, they couldn't, but now email is like right there. If you open the inbox, you have to read it. And then, very disturbing as they were, they created a lot of discord. Not only that, but he had uh, friends, friends, at least they thought he was their friends, and he envied, he couldn't, because in his promiscuous life, in his life, he couldn't find someone to be his partner. And uh, he never settled with anyone. So he envied this couple whom were his friends. And what did he do? Because he had this envy inside of him. He started writing anonymous letters to the couple, to the woman, telling that her husband was betraying her, cheating on her. Writing to the man, saying anonymously that the wife was cheating on him. At a time when this was a big dishonor for many people, especially for men. Now this is more common, right? 
Not saying it's right, but it's like, oh, okay, I was cheating. Next, and then next relationship. But at that time, it was a big dishonor. So the man was so feeling this excruciating pain. The, the couple never talked to each other about the letters. They believed them. And that's, again, when communication between couples really puts things downhill. They never talked to each other. He thought the letters were true because he was very assertive. He had a gift. He was using his intelligence to do things that were not proper. So Anderson, in a way, convinced them in such a way that the husband decided to kill himself. He didn't want people to know that his wife was cheating on him. Well, things didn't stop there, Dr. Bezerra says. He didn't stop there. You see, society didn't know why he killed himself. She would never disclose it. And for her, the woman, she thought he did that because he was ashamed of coming true to her and saying he was betraying her. So she fell in deep depression and died. You know, depression can be as pathological and can drive us crazy. And he didn't stop there. And funny enough, he kept pretending he was friends of the wife before she died. And she knew everything he was doing. He didn't stop there. He fell in love with a lady, but the lady didn't like him. And he was frustrated, especially when he got to know that she received this um, marriage proposal by another guy who loved her very much and was reciprocated in his love. But he was not happy. Anderson was not happy about it. So again he goes, writing the infamous letter to the future husband, telling terrible things, as if he were, but he didn't sign, it was anonymous. A boyfriend that she had, and a boyfriend, you know, and telling all the things that happened to them. So he disgraced her life. The fiancé didn't want to dispute the veracity of the letters. So what did he do? He left her before the wedding. And then she fell in depression, locked herself in the bedroom, never left, didn't want to eat, died. So here we have at least three of Anderson's victims. But think about it. Maybe this case is very extreme for us. But often the spirit mentors tell us, do you think people suffer in this world because they're living a very straight life? Maybe they're trying this life. But many of them is. still lie, still slender people. Still, I see nowadays in businesses, People want to go home and say, I want to find harmony. But at work, they deceive people. They lie to each other. They create discord among colleagues. How can I go home and find happiness if I am already creating unhappiness around? So it's very unlikely that this is going to happen. And when it mounts to these cases, this level, then for ambition, people may kill. For pride, they may lie and deceive and steal and rob. Where does it all stay? Here, I know, we all know, these are truths that are not easy to digest. But we need to face it for our own benefit. For the sooner that we realize it, we can help one another and go to the next level. So I ask this question to Divaldo Franco getting to know more of the spiritual roots of autism. In, a, in an interview that is going to be published in the next issue of the Spiritist magazine in April. So I ask, why does it happen more often in boys than in girls? I think the answer is very, it's of deep psychology. Because it tells us about the masculine inside of all of us because it's not a chauvinistic answer. The spirits answered the following. Despots, 
violent people, the ones who engender wars and other conflicts are typically coming from the male gender, you know. Usually the violence inside of us comes from our male characteristics. When Carl Gustav Jung talks about the yin and yang, the animus animus inside of all of us, then we realize that the ones that create wars, discord, conflicts are that part of us. And that's the reason why more boys than girls get to face autism. With more wars happening in the world throughout the many decades, where are those spirits going to reincarnate and how? So it's a blessed opportunity. It's a blessed opportunity. It's a temporary condition to really rebalance the spiritual body of that person. And then the treatment comes in these last moments of our conversation here. As Dr. Bezer, this is his picture, he says, the spiritist psychotherapy allied to the modern healing techniques will definitely contribute, <coughs> contribute to change humankind's mental chart. So we would say going to doctors, therapists, and treat it is a must, but then we can add the spiritist techniques to boost the mental health of autistic children and young adults or adults. And this is one of the success stories of the spiritist therapy that we found in the spiritist psychiatric hospitals. It's the only place where we find psychiatric hospitals being run by spiritist organizations. All and every spirit, uh, psychiatric hospitals in Brazil are run by uh, spiritist uh, organization. They combine the medical treatment with the spiritist technique. Hopefully one day it's going to happen in the U.S. and elsewhere. So Raphael was one of these boys who had autism. Besides all that medicine could tell, this doctor who reported it, he's a spiritist, he's a psychiatric, psychiatrist, and he reported in this book put together by the Brazilian Association of Med Spiritist Do Medical Doctors, that when they gave the passes therapy, the mentor said that the autism in his case, in Raphael's case, was due to lack of vital energy, ectoplasm, what we call. We all have ectoplasm, vital energy, that gives life to our physical bodies. But in his case, the spirits identified he lacked this vital energy. And that's why he was more in the spirit realm than here. So what did he do? They used the realignment of the chakras or the vital centers, as we say, through the passive therapy. And by giving, applying that energy, they brought it together, the balance to that. So after six months, they saw great improvement in Raphael. Besides that, the passive therapy, something, for example, we do on Mondays, we also learned that the entities that were connected to Raphael because of previous life's connections, they were being rescued little by little, gradually, through what we call the disobsession treatment. It's what we do in the spiritual side of Baltimore as well. When people leave from the spiritual treatment, the mediumistic group stays, and there we serve as instruments to the good spirits who bring these entities, and through the spirit counseling, they are invited to a new opportunity because they are suffering. To be after someone is not to be happy. If they were happy, they wouldn't. So they are the first ones to be suffering, and they were rescued. And the case of autism really um, pro um, was helped with the technique. So then we would summarize the main things in spiritism that could be very beneficial 
if worked in collaboration with medical doctors, psychotherapists, uh, social workers, etc. Add one, learn to talk with the spirit. The loving dialogue, the, lo the dialogue of self-forgiveness. If these spirits, they are encapsulated in their guilt, what we call self-obsession, then we're going to gradually give them food, spiritual food, to come out of that capsule, to destroy that capsule, energetic capsule, that restrains them into self-obsession. How? And this is when we recall the wisdom of another spiritist who lived in Brazil at the beginning of the 20th century, Dr. Uh, Barsanufo. He was an educator, he was a professor, he was a, an extraordinary medium, had all different types of mediumship, from bicorpority to healing and many others. So he taught us that we need to talk to these spirits as we should talk to one another, spirit to spirit. So parents should talk to their autistic children and educators to their to the autistic patients, not as, oh, you're a child or you're an adolescent, but eye to eye, although they avoid it, but still keeping in mind that we're talking to a millennial spirit may not, that may not express what they're thinking, but they're listening and invite them to self-forgiveness. Truly, saying, we all miss the mark. And it should be done on a daily basis. And especially, as they say, when they are sleeping. Because parents especially should sit down next to their autistic child. And when they are sleeping, in a very soothing voice, invite them to self-forgiveness and saying, aff affirmatively saying, I know you are perfect inside, you were given opportunities in previous lives, you missed the mark, but here is God giving you the opportunity to come to terms with your guilt. Forgive yourself. Tell yourself, Forgive, I forgive myself. And you keep being this affirmative voice to that spirit. Educators shall also do the same and develop this technique that is very promising from any age group, babies to seniors. It's a technique that is very um, effective. To the passive therapy, bring them to the center to any center that you know, apply. It's almost miraculous in many ways when we s observe that that's not only going to realign, rebalance, but keep the, the entities that are disturbing at the rescue work. And that's what we're talking about as its obsession treatment, our rescue work. It's the spirit release therapy, okay? The bottom line is that we have in front of us an immortal spirit that is in need of a loving education. And whoever, whomever is living with an autistic person or in charge of educating or treating is invited in a spiritual perspective to add this element. We have someone that is in essence divine and is experiencing something that shall pass. With our help, it's going to pass much faster. Okay? I'd like to stop here and give a few minutes for possible questions. Okay. Yes? My first question is, because they say... Oh, sorry, I forgot. I keep forgetting about this. Okay. My first question is, they don't seem very self-aware that they have a problem, so is it more of a spiritual timeout? The, the lifetime that they're going to spend because it's more of a learning experience for the pa parent and the family people around them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so are they serving, that's their way to serve as a learning, like to provide mm -hmm. somebody else with a learning experience while they're in a spiritual timeout. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
we shall never generalize the cases, but for the most part, the people who have autism, they use their intelligence in the wrong direction, in an unhealthy direction. And usually they had pride at higher levels. And it may express right here and now, as they are, you know, they don't show that they are in need of anything. Some are very, like they present more depressive traits, and others more this anger. They express that anger out. Oh, so it's still a pattern. I could show you video clips for the ones who could understand better if they, if they are not aware of this. For example, a boy that was aligning for a parent to our eyes, no reason. Ken's. And he had a hammer. And his, his game was to smash the cans. He would align them neatly, and then start smashing them. Why? Now think, for the ones who are play therapists, they would know better mm -hmm. how to transpose from a previous life into that new game. So they're still, remember, the sad memories from previous lives are sometimes still very vivid to them. And they may be hypnotized sometimes. The parents cannot see, but the screen is right in front of them, inside of their conscience. So, in a way, in a way, they are in this timeout, but we need to help them come out of this running away process of themselves. Okay? Someone else has another question that you'd like to have addressed. Is the loving dialogue applicable for any other mental illness or even for a parent to guide the, their child? You loving. know, when yeah, the loving dialogue, when they are sleeping and you talk to them. Loving parents who know of this apply it. They do apply it. And uh, it really works. I know some parents don't know of the technique. That's why they don't do. But once they do, they can do. And we don't need to be a parent. We can be a brother or sister. And be kind and soothing. And sometimes we don't need to say a whole dialogue. But just say one affirmation. You are a child of God. Think about the power in these very words. To feel that we are children of God. It's not trivial. To feel that we are a child of God has so many implications. It can change the course of our decisions. Okay? I'm just curious with the increase in autism. Is it any way related to the fact that we may be thinking we're entering a shift on this planet where we're going to increase our vibration and be of a more positive nature? That this is like a cleansing of old souls to get them ready? Very good. That's the other part. I didn't tell the whole story because you read more in the interview with Devaldo Franco in the magazine. You know, the International Spiritist Council puts a lot of effort and money into this magazine. We needed to market it because it's a beautiful work. So there you read exactly what Paula mentioned to us. So to recap, in other words, Everyone evolves in the universe or universes, planets as well. Because if we evolve, the planet does as well. Planet Earth is clearly in a transition right now. And it's a transition that people is gonna they think like 2012, everything's gonna be rosy. No, 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 no. We have major things happening that will better each and every year. But it's not going to be a regenerated planet all of a sudden in a few more years. But it's changing. How is it going to change? God provides new opportunities. So those who miss the mark, like all of us, we will be back. And in such conditions, so it's going to be a drainage. It's like draining. You see, that's the article. When the illness is the cure. I know that when we are feeling pain 
It's hard. We cry. Because I've been feeling this sciatica. I know. And I, I remind I myself, Vanessa, it's your cure. This is your cure. But it shall pass. But how are we going to drain our disturbances in these blessed impairments? To wrap it up, neuroscience has done this experiment to show us how disabilities and impairments are a boost to our own progress. That wasn't their goal, but that's how we see the study that they did. So they got stroke patients, and uh, they did the following experiment. So if their right side was impaired, they put a mitt in the good hand, around the good hand. So people would avoid using the good hand to force them to use the one that was impaired. And they saw the progress in the brain of the person. They saw the progress in the whole constitution of the body because if we stay in the comfort zone, we don't progress. So the bottom line of autism, it's one of the many ways that we find to rebalance ourselves, draining our disturbances through the beauty and collaboration of this connection with the physical body. And again, as we said at the beginning, in the panoramic view of life, it's just one split moment. For us, it's a long life, but in immortality, it's one dot in the many dots of many lives. Okay. Just a quick one. It's very practical. As an educator working in a school with autistic children, can I speak silently to the student? I'm just trying to picture me doing this dialogue out loud, you know, in a public school. <laughs> <laughs> silently, you mean mind to mind? Thoughts are things. Very good, Paula. A very important reminder. We cannot say what we don't think. So before we say, we need to think. And when we cannot say, still we can think. And when we send them, thoughts are real things. They can actually. If I send these loving thoughts to someone saying, you are capable, you're good, you're a child of God, you, are, you have extra, a wonderful potential, that's so we'll feel better. So, good point, Paula. Okay, one last. Cheryl? I once went to visit Kennedy Krieger, which is, um, specializes in treatment of yeah. mental health issues. And um, she explained how, how difficult it was to get in there. There's a waiting list, like a year or two to get in, in, for in, 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 um, in, in you know, to, to be in-house for treatment. And... Uh, she pointed out a young man who had been there for um, a year and a half, and the cost is $3,000 a day to be there. So he had been there quite a long time. And uh, he didn't have this particular problem, I don't think, but I, I don't have all the particulars. But he kept, you know, uh, he, he was banging his head and doing things, self-destructive kind of things. And she said that um, they had tried uh, acupuncture. And within days, he was ready to go home. Mm. So I'm wondering how that is involved with autism. Well, you see what you're talking about. Thank you for the example. Because in acupuncture, we find the energy work. When we're talking about the lack of ectoplasm and the realignment of the vital centers or the chakras, there you go. We find in that opportunity, like the passes, acupuncture, or any other type, the realignment, and with that, boosting uh, a healthier life as well that will affect certainly the physical body. Acupuncture people, some, we know, the practitioners know we are working with the energy field, but sometimes it's more dramatic than they imagine. We know through spiritism that homeopathic remedy, acupuncture, they work in the spiritual body first. It's it's beyond even the energy body, what we call the vital, the vital body. 
It's even beyond that. We're talking about the matrix of our physical organic life being boosted and then reflecting it in the physical body later on, as you said, successfully um, making the person uh, recover or feel better. As again, autism is a wide range. They call it like um, the spectrum of autism. It's so wide. There are many types, many levels. And in that range, this will work in some fashion. Okay? All right? How about if now we receive the spiritual passes? Okay? Our practitioners will serve as instruments. You can stay where you are. All we need to do for the spirit doctors are here. They've been here throughout the whole time, even before we came here. They already know what we need. All we need to do is to be open, thinking of beautiful things. And let's do it together as we prepare ourselves. And they shall bless the, the water we'll drink at the end as well.